right. Well, good snowy Montreal Valentine's afternoon. <laughs> and welcome to our sixth session of our bilingual course commemorating the ILO centenary entitled Transnational Futures of International Labor Law, La Justice Sociale dans le Monde du Travail. My name is Adele Blackett. I'm Canada Research Chair of Transnational Labor Law and Development here at the Faculty of Law, McGill University, and a 2016 Fellow of the Pierre Elliott Trudeau Foundation that is sponsoring this initiative. Je tiens à reconnaître que notre cours a lieu sur le territoire traditionnel et non cédé de la Confédération Haudenosaunee, une terre qui a aussi servi de lieu de rencontre entre peuples autochtones, y compris les Anishinaabe. La session passée, nous avons abordé la question de la responsabilité corporative des entreprises avec une séance comme plusieurs qui nous a rappelé à quel point le droit transnational du travail est enraciné dans le droit domestique et nous avons donc souligné à la fois les initiatives à l'échelle internationale, à l'OIT, aux Nations Unies, et à la foulée d'acteurs, y compris les corporations elles-mêmes qui se sont impliquées. Et nous avons aussi abordé les questions liées à l'échelle nationale, comme euh, des réfugiés, par exemple, qui portent des affaires jusqu'à notre Cour suprême du Canada pour réclamer la responsabilité pour des violations alléguées du droit international du travail. Et nous avons mené une interrogation sérieuse sur l'inégalité profonde qui est derrière ces mouvances pour faire en sorte à ce que le droit réagit. Uh, et les conséquences donc pour une justice globale et sociale. Today we have the pleasure to welcome someone who is in the process of offering a significant contribution to the literature on global justice and international labor rights, Professor Faina Milman Sivan, and consequently an extension of our conversation from the last class. But today's focus is on a distinct, but I would suggest related aspect of her work, one that engages closely with the ILO's supervisory body's lengthy uh, analysis of forced labor, uh, convention number 29, adopted in 1930, and to which the ILO has very recently, 2014, added a protocol uh, and that protocol includes in its Article 1, and I quote, specific action against trafficking in persons for the purposes of forced or compulsory labor, end of quote. The Forced Labor Convention number 29 was a document introduced during the colonial period and as part of a division of labor with the League of Nations that saw the latter adopt the 1926 convention to suppress the slave trade and slavery. It should be added that the ILO has a second convention uh, on forced labor, convention number 105, the abolition of forced labor convention dated 1957, which followed the adoption by the United Nations of the supplementary convention on the abolition of slavery, the slave trade, and institutions and practices similar to slavery of 1956 uh, to provide for the complete abolition of debt bondage and serfdom. The topic of prison labor though, occupies a unique place, a troubled history in relation to both, particularly in jurisdictions where there has been documented continuity between the transatlantic slave trade, imprisonment, and prison labor. Think of uh, some of the recent work, Black Men's Slavery by Another Name, chronicling the enslavement uh, of former uh, slaves through prison labor, and recently Ava DuVernay's work on the 13th Amendment to the use of the US Constitution that provides that neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted shall exist within the United States. Leading labor law scholars and scholars of slavery in the law have both been challenging the interpretation given to this provision in the US Constitution as it relates to prison labor. They've also been build, building a vision of labor law that is referred to as a positive labor vision. And it should be noted uh, in terms of ratification that while Canada and the United States have both ratified convention number 105, Canada ratified convention number 29 only in 2011. And the US has yet to ratify it. Convention 29 and convention 105 
are both fundamental conventions, as we saw from the beginning of this class, and they have been quite widely ratified, 178 countries for 29, 175 countries for 105. So we'll have an opportunity through a discussion of prison labor to look rather closely at uh, the normative content of Convention 29 and some of the contemporary issues that are being grappled with uh, in relation to this and their transnational consequences. So it's a great pleasure for me now to introduce to you our guest speaker, Dr. Faina Milman-Sivan, who's an associate professor of law uh, at the University of Haifa. And her research and publications focus on critical analyses of the international labor law regime, freedom of association, and of course, prison labor. She holds an LLM and JSD from Columbia University in New York and articled at the Israeli Supreme Court with the former Chief Justice Dorit Bainish. She was a Global Hauser Fellow at the New York University Faculty of Law in 2013 and has received uh, quite a range of prestigious grants, including from the Israel Science Foundation and the Germany Israel Foundation. She's co-editor of a leading book to which I've alluded, uh, Global Justice and International Labor Rights, a Cambridge University Press publication from 2016 with uh, her colleagues uh, Yashi Dahan and Hannah Lerner. And she is the co-editor of the law journals Labor and Society, sorry, Labor, Society and Law with uh, another esteemed colleague in labor law, Guy Mundluck. So her presentation today, as you've gathered from my introductory words, could hardly be more timely. And uh, it is provocatively called On the ILO and Prison Labor, a Time for a Recalibration. Thank you, Professor Milman Sivan, for coming. Thank you, Adel. Um, so I would like to uh, begin by saying what a great, uh, distinct honor this is to participate in this uh, visionary seminar uh, and thank uh, Professor Blackett for inviting me and Emily and all the staff that helped me actually get here through the snowstorm and all of you for uh, choosing to spend Valentine's Day with us. So thank you. <laughs> I really appreciate this. Uh, this paper is an invitation to rethink the ILO's normative landscape governing prison labor. And I believe the centennial anniversary of the ILO to be an apt opportunity to re-engage with the fundamental dilemma informing the ILO's approach to prison labor, uh, which is to what extent the private public institutional setting within which prisoners work should be determinative of the regulatory framework governing such work. How decisive should the private-public divide be in this context? So this is basically the question that lies at the crux of this presentation and this uh, paper. And before we begin, uh, I would like to share some background on the research. Uh, so this paper was written written uh, by me and my colleague, Yair Sagi, also from the University of uh, Haifa, and as part of a larger project, which we are conducted uh, with the generous support of the Israeli Science Foundation. And theoretically, we basically advocate a labor law-based approach to prison labor. Currently, it's only or mostly uh, been addressed by criminologists and administrative law uh, considerations, and we believe that labor law has not been there sufficiently, and this is the larger project that uh, we address. Uh, and empirically, we are investigating for the first time the realities and the history of the Israeli uh, prison labor legal system, uh, which nobody apparently has written <laughs> about. Uh, and it was the Israeli legal system that led us to the ILO. Um, as you may know, the Israeli legal system famously remains the alone in unequivocally declaring private ownership of prison to be unconstitutional for um, violating and infringing on prisoners' constitutional right of dignity. As one of the many Israeli academics advising the plaintiffs 
at the time, I have introduced ILO Convention Number 29 as an argument against private prisons. And so the convention has actually played a role, albeit a minor role, in this celebrated 2009 counter-privatization case. Uh, in the decade that passed, however, since 2009, we have discovered, Yair Sagi and I, an increasing involvement of private entities in prison labor in Israel. In fact, we identified what we term a process of, in effect, privatization of prison labor in Israel under the shadow of the 2009 counter-privatization case. Our analysis thus reveals the fascinating and disturbing manners in which new liberalism took hold of prison labor in Israel, even in the aftermath of the 2009 counter-privatization landmark case. Uh, indeed, one of the important lessons of the Israeli story is the danger posed to laboring prisoners' welfare, even while working for state organs and however their constitutional rights might be upheld in court cases, and they, they are upheld uh, in Israel. This led us to question the productiveness of the ILO's binary private-public outlook in tackling this danger, especially in the era of undisputed rise of neoliberalism uh, and economic policies in many industrialized states. So let's look at the outline of this talk. What, basically what I'm going to do, um, can I have uh, slide number one here, over here? Yes, okay. Uh, in what follows, I will first concisely outline the ILO approach towards prison labor, then I will survey the harsh criticism leveled at the ILO by leading industrial countries such as the UK, uh, uh, Germany, Austria, Australia, etc advocating that the ILO relaxes the safeguards against forced private prison labor. I will then present our theoretical underpinnings and will conclude by outlining our normative insights. Our research casts doubt on the usefulness of a clear-cut private-public dichotomy that underpinned the ILO's approach. However, crucially, unlike the industrial states, advocating the relaxing of the safeguards against privatized prison labor, our, our article calls for the introduction of comparable safeguards to state prisoners' labor setting. More precisely, rather than focusing on the formalistic binary division into private and public categories, the focus of attention should be directed at eradicating exploitation harmful practices of labor, wherever they may be found. So let us uh, begin with a short survey of the ILO's approach. Uh, next step. According to the ILO, there should be a stark division between the prison labor in the service of private entities and such labor done for pu public organs. The ILO dichotomous stance draws on the path-breaking ILO convention, just mentioned, number 29, which came into force in 1930. The convention, which was drafted against the backdrop of exploitative, inhumane, and racist practices, was supported by several rationales. For example, prison labor's potential impact on market competition, shielding laboring prisoners from exploitation, and assuring their well-being was another leading rationale, and our research focuses only on the latter rationale, and we will bracket for now any market competition concerns. So what does Convention 29 tell us about prison labor? Under the terms of Article 22C, which is the cent central provision in our context, the involvement of private entities in prisoner employment, unless under voluntary terms, constitutes a violation of the convention. At the same time, the convention permits states to compel their convicted offenders to work. This state exception, okay, is set in the same article, 2 to C, 
reflecting a broad international consensus as to the right of the nation state to force prisoners to work. Note that as a general matter, industrial states legally require their prisoners to work and refusal to work would normally result in a variety of sanctions. Now, Article 2 to C stipulates that for prison work to fall within the state exception, it must be both carried out under the supervision and control of the public authority and under the condition that the prisoner is not hired or placed at the disposal of private individuals, companies, or associations. If either of the two conditions is not observed, the state exemption provided in the convention does not apply. Does not apply. And thus, prison labor, again, falls under the convention's prohibition on forced or compulsory, compulsory labor. The practical implication is that virtually any involvement of private entity in forced prison labor, however rigorously supervised by state organs, for example, is likely to be prohibited. Now, the foregoing may give the wrong impression that private entities are never allowed to employ prisoners under any conditions. This is not the case. The convention defines forced labor as all work or service which is exacted from any person under the menace of any penalty and for which said person has not offered himself voluntarily. So it follows that if voluntarily prison labor for private benefit is permitted and does not fall under the scope of the convention. But think about it. Could prisoners consent to work ever be voluntary? What would voluntary consent even mean within the confines of prison, where every aspect of prisoners' life, their behavior, bodily integrity, mental state, ability to work, and so forth, is fully controlled? Still, it is the ILO's position that a genuine consent to work in prison is theoretically possible. So to ensure that the consent is sufficiently genuine, the ILO Committee of Experts has outlined several strict conditions that must be complied with. As we shall see, the ILO has set the bar high for achieving assent. And these are the conditions right there. You can see them. So the first condition that must be met for consent is that it must be formal. In other words, uh, a work agreement must be uh, signed, and this condition is usually the easiest condition uh, to comply with for prisoners usually generally are interested in working, and the problem is often the shortage of work opportunities. The second condition, which derives from the convention's definition of forced labor, is that the work should be conducted freely without fear of penalty, and the third condition is that prisoners work, the third requirement is that prisoners work condition resemble as closely as possible work conditions outside of prison walls. In other words, the free market. This is considered the most reliable objective indicator of true genuine consent and these work conditions include the level of remuneration as well as health and safety and social security conditions. What exactly would qualify as work conditions that are sufficiently similar to market conditions has yet to be precisely defined, but the ILO has elicited several indicators. Thus, for example, it is said that wages that are slightly below the minimum wage are acceptable but on condition that they are not so low as to be considered exploitative. To be sure, most states regard the latter requirement, free market condition or similar to free market condition, particularly challenging, not surprisingly, you can imagine, arguing and, and they, are, they consider it to be devastating to prisoners arguing it drastically reduces prisoners' opportunities to obtain employment. Okay, so this is a big uh, contention point between the states and the ILO. Now, notice what Professor Fenway calls the paradox of ILO regulation of prison labor. The detailed and penetrating standards that the ILO set for prison labor for private entity on the one hand, and the lack thereof 
when it comes to work performed in the public center, sector on the other. Now, this approach gave rise to a significant pushback in the past two decades. Um, yes. After an in-depth examination of the recent tension between the ILO supervisory system and the key advanced industrial states, we believe that the latter essentially aim to expand the ILO's state exemption and thus reconcile it with the growing practice of private involvement in prison labor. So this is our reading of the contention between the supervisory system and key industrial states. So we've read like uh, all the observations in the last uh, 20 or so years, and we think it's a fair reading of what is going on there. Uh, this controversy is particularly interesting and disturbing, we believe, not only because the ILO standards are not complied with, but because of the undertones that underline the replies of key industrial states whenever addressed. These replies indicate that these countries intend to continue ignoring and defying ILO's interpretation of Convention 29, which they deem to be unproductive. So uh, this we find particularly interesting because this is not developing state. This is the UK, this is Germany, right? This is Austria. Uh, these states put forward both doctrinal and normative arguments. For example, several interpretations of Convention 29 have been advocated over the years, arguing that private hiring of prisoners should be legitimized under the Convention when conducted under strict supervision by public institutions, as such supervision could effectively guarantee prisoners' rights, and this is especially true, the argument goes, if robust legislative framework mandates prisoners' working condition and ensures their access to effective complaint mechanism. Another direction for challenging the ILO strict dichotomist approach was to suggest that the two requirements included in Article 2 to C, remember the need for uh, supervision by public authority and the prohibition on placing prisoners at the disposal of private enterprises, were interchangeable. A related claim asserts that prisoners are not hired to or placed at the disposal of private individuals when the legal custody of prisoners does not transfer to private entities. These are all doctrinal arguments that uh, we've gathered from the replies to the observations and uh, discussions that the ILO had with uh, key industrial states. Several states reproached for violating our Article 2 to C have tried a different line of argument asserting that the ILO must differentiate between two types of private involvement in prisons, contradicting between the article usage of two terms, hired to on the one hand and placed at the disposal of on the other hand. It is argued that only the former is restricted therein. The distinction between these two terms rests on the question of whether the private entity pays the state for the prisoner's services, this is hired for, right? So this is leasing, uh, I don't know if you've discussed that. Uh, or rather, the state pays the private entity for the services of the private entity. This is placed at the disposal of. Concerns about the prisoner's exploitation via the hired to method hinge on the lowering working conditions when the sum paid to the state is per capita or a lump sum, right? You pay and then you want to extert, extract as much work as you possibly can. However, in the modern penal practice, these work arrangements patter out and it is the state that subsidizes the private entity with a view to providing prison services. It is claimed, therefore, that these latter types of arrangements, which fall under the term place at the disposal of, pose a significantly lesser risk of prisoners' well-being due to the divergent economic incentives that they provide. There has also been normative arguments. Next slide. 
Uh, similarly put forward, for example, the ILO position is damaging to prisoners, their rehabilitation, it renders work by prisoners in many prisons no longer viable and promotes idleness, etc. The ILO, however, has not been impressed by such arguments. It has persistently rejected all such readings of the convention. So, the question stands. Can and should the public-private dichotomy be maintained when considering contemporary prison labor practice? Let's move to our normative theoretical uh, starting point, and we'll come back to the ILO uh, later on. So our normative perception of prison labor as regulated by the ILO is related to a broader intellectual movement of rethinking and challenging the fundamental private-public distinction. Almost 40 years ago, Duncan Kennedy wrote, the private-public distinction is dead. But is it? Kennedy himself was quick to add that the distinction still rules us from the grave. We believe on these, we build on these insights and believe that the empirical schools and specifically the empirical publicness theory are particularly relevant for our purposes. So this is our starting point and I'll begin with just uh, talking a little bit about the publicness theory. So publicness takes a deep look into the realities on the ground in the actual operation of organizations. This is generally organization, not specifically prison labor, right? Um, and it places them on an empirical publicness grid consisting of two axes, the economic and public authority. Publicness theory unsettles rigid divisions of organizations into public or private, highlighting the fact that most organizations are steeped to a varying degree in both spheres. Specifically, the analysis made in the latter theory of public and private organizational traits revolves around three dimensions, each representing a continuum. Form of ownership, right, who owns the organization. Funding, what is the source of funding? Is it taxes, is it subsidies, is it uh, customers, payments? and control, to what extent the organization's behavior is constrained by political demands and regulations, or rather, by customer demands and competitive pressure. Okay, so this is one theoretical uh, starting point, and significantly, in the prison labor context, Stephen Garvey similarly ventures beyond the public-private dichotomy <laughs> and provides a helpful typology that would allow us to distinguish between the old and new organizational forms of prison labor. In he an historical account of the development of the penitentiary forms in the US, Garvey identifies several dimensions according to which prison labor had been organized over the years. These dimensions include, and you can see them uh, on the slide, the locus of control over the production process, the market within which the products could be sold. Could they be sold uh, on the open market or just the state? And the locus of responsibility of prisoners' custody, care, and discipline. So basically, whether the prisons can be privatized. Garvey's analysis and the publicness literature point to a promising line of inquiry. Viewed through these theoretical lenses, the publicness of the state exemption, for example, could insightfully be reassessed. So our contention is basically this. When examining the reality of modern prison labor in industrial member states, it becomes clear that the private-public distinction in this field has become increasingly unstable and eventually unsustainable. Most systems today we submit are hybrid systems. I do not have time here to demonstrate this claim by applying these dimensions. And in a different article, we have applied our criteria to the Israeli reality and concluded that according to this criteria, even the Israeli prison labor, again, where no private prison 
exist or are considered to be even constitutional should be considered a hybrid system. Next slide. So uh, I'm not going to talk about that, but this is basically the, the, the chart. Um, the traditional categorical distinctions which conventionally define the private and the, and the public spheres no longer adequately reflect a clear divide, but rather a complex reality of overlapping rationales and modes of organizational operations. In fact, we do not have to look far for evidence that the public-private division is fundamentally, fundamentally unsustainable in our context. Suffice to, invo to invoke prison labor's rehabilitative rationale. Think about rehabilitation, right? It is commonly acknowledged that for prison labor to fully attain its rehabilitative qualities, labor, even when it is steeped in public characteristic, should resemble to the fullest extent possible work done outside of private market. This, of course, includes both condition of work and the quality of work, and the inner mingling of both spheres is thus surely intrinsic to the rehabilitation prison labor. And I do not have time to get into other examples, but there are plenty of other examples. But in short, the commingling of private public elements in prison labor calls for revisiting the normative framework controlling the operation. But there is another reason for revisiting the ILO's binary divide. Recall that a key rationale of the ILO's approach is the fear that market-based considerations and constraints might result in exploitation. It makes sense, right? Historically, this was the case with the practice of leasing prisoners, for example. State organs, conversely, are assumed to be immune of market-based consideration and be motivated instead by public values such as rehabilitation, uh, etc. However, these assumptions are significantly undercut once we realize that today public prison agencies in charge of prison employment often operate under similar market constraints as those informing private entities. The spread of neoliberalism and related approaches, such as the new public management theories, throughout public services in general and in prison labor management in particular, give us a reason to question the private-public divide. Additionally, current evidence from Israel and the US, for example, substantiate the claim that public setting could be just as or even more oppressive to prisoners, laborers, as private setting. In Israel, for example, this, were, this um, as well as other phenomena, like mishandling of financial records and prisoners' hourly roster, occurred within a setting where private enti entities were absent. And some exploitative practices, in fact, subsided when prisons moved towards the private end of the continuum. Recall also that private, that public accountability measures might fail miserably when prisons are concerned. So, next slide. Turning back to the ILO, if the private public distinction is blurry at best, we may ask what alternatives are there? And frankly, I'm not sure there are any, but uh, let, me, uh, <laughs> let me just give you our uh, thoughts. While our journey led us to accept that prison labor institutions, whether private or public, are inherently impure spheres, both in their logic and aims, as well as in how they operate, it's beyond this paper's scope to provide a conclusive framework for a normative reform and I will just briefly outline some preliminary thoughts and before I do, a caveat. It seems that our analysis reveals the true nature of various arguments raised by key industrial states against the ILO's policy. These contentions could be described as attempt to recast the private-public distinction along a more nuanced realistic typology which could be better understood 
considering the publicness theory or Garvey's typology of organizational forms of private prison. On this reading, member states, in fact, implore the ILO to take into account publicness indicators and examine issues such as these, whether the locus of control over production is kept within private or public hands, whether public or private authority disciplines and provides care and custody for prisoners. Considering the latter question, the states proceed to argue that where such authority is public, the state exemption should apply. Our analysis of recent ILO observations suggests that when the forced labor of one group of prisoners is afforded full immunity from oversight, which is the case with the state exemption, key even key industrial states would in inevitably attempt to expand the number of prisoners within this immune group. Thus viewed the state exemption sanctuary in itself, we argue, is a threat to the ILO's goal to protect the prisoners compelled to work for private entity. Surely, thorough deliberations and further contemplation are warranted, and at this point, I can only offer our initial intuition that the ILO would be ill-advised to follow the member state's lead and recede its strict normative demands for the private sector. Taking into account the potential oppress oppressive nature of employment by the states, two courses of action seem to be most promising, and I will just uh, uh, briefly outline these two courses of action. The first is to, uh, last slide, I think, yes. Uh, the first is to redefine the line between the private and the public along a continuum. Hin hinging on the indicators of publicness that underline organizational forms of prison labor. This reclassification would coincide in turn with varying degrees of normative standards, including standards for work conditions, which would assure fair treatment of prisoners. So this is one option. Another possibility could entail abandoning the private-public divide altogether Instead of deciphering indicators for the organizational forms of production, the ILO could consider uniform standards hinging not on the organizational forms of prison labor at hand, but rather on the direct prevention of exploitation. In other words, the ILO could impose specific constraints and limitation on how to avoid exploitation regardless of whether the employing body is private or uh, public. Do I have a minute to some? Yeah, sure. Having fleshed out the ILO uh, thinking on the normative landscape governing prison labor, the paper turns to the reality of modern prison systems. It highlights the growing challenges and practical and theoretical difficulties of the private and public dichotomous regulation of prison labor and calls to transcend this divide. However, unlike other detractors of the dichotomy, we call for a rethinking on both sides of the divide, if, as it were. Uh, exploitative labor practices might be surely found in public as well as private setting, and we therefore believe that a radical shift of focus is in order with the view to safeguarding prisoners from abusive treatment. Thank you. That's right. Thank you very much. Extremely uh, insightful and provocative uh, presentation. And now uh, I will uh, have an opportunity to turn to a topic that has also elicited the language of forced labor, even the language of contemporary slavery, um, that of domestic work. Uh, so, and the connection uh, to the presentation you've just heard uh, comes at another level as well. Here is a field, domestic work, uh, where the public and private distinction has uh, a way 
of uh, continuing to hold uh, considerable sway and much of the standard setting around decent work for domestic workers turned on both thinking really carefully about historical legacies of unfreedom um, and thinking about what it looks like to challenge those, uh, what it looks like, in other words, to bring to the fore a decidedly labor vision of uh, free labor. Uh, in other words, what does decent work mean? Uh, so I'm delighted today uh, to be able to present uh, some of the work that has, uh, um, to which I've turned much of the last decade of my life, um, and that is finally uh, about to appear uh, in a book manuscript uh, called Everyday Transgressions, Domestic Workers' Transnational Challenge to International Labor Law. And the book chronicles the standard setting process, something that you've started to see already in this course with two uh, examples. One, the Maritime Labor Convention and its process, and a process that's actually in play right now, uh, the Violence at Work Convention. Um, uh, my focus was on the adoption of what um, remains the last convention that the ILO adopted, Convention 189 and its accompanying recommendation number 201. And as the people who care for others, domestic workers are accustomed to not really being seen, not really being heard, and the historical accounts remind us of the link to domestic slavery, colonial servitude, and persisting vestiges found in the so-called common sense of the status-based relationship of master and servant. And there are many poignant sociological accounts that were really at the heart of the background of the standard setting process that emphasize domestic workers' invisibility even as they perform the hard and dirty work associated with social reproduction. We're not supposed to see domestic workers' desires, needs, or aspirations. And so the relationship involves domestic workers, but the condition is that they get everything done. The cooking, the cleaning, the other so-called menial tasks, which may include childcare and even emotional labor. And they have to do it so that it actually seems invisible. Uh, so the literature stresses the extent to which uh, domestic workers, overwhelmingly women, often highly educated with care responsibilities of their own, uh, leave family and home to travel abroad to provide care. And in so doing, they are both very publicly crossing uh, international lines, but they're also abandoned into uh, so-called private households. Uh, all of this captures the extent to which uh, the work uh, is both undervalued uh, and under-evaluated. I'm starting, and you can see from this slide, with uh, the words of a domestic worker herself, Fatima El Ayoubi, who was a domestic worker, is a domestic worker in Paris. She's of Moroccan heritage, and she wrote a book entitled Pierre à la Lune, which was turned into a film and celebrated at Cannes, actually. And she wrote this book while she was recovering from a nervous breakdown. And she consciously chose to speak uh, for all of the Fatima, and I'm quoting here, who work in the shadows alone and far from their families, end of quote. And she reminds us of the art that inhabits her back-breaking work. And let me quote here. Many people do not understand what is art. I've always worked looking for the elegance in what I do, even when I iron a shirt. What I want to feel inside of me is an aesthetic harmony. I iron shirts, I dust. I clean the world to admire the beauty and the cleanliness. This art to which I have applied myself nine hours each day all these years, no one sees it. And when I come back the next day, I commence to suffer yet again in my body and in my soul. I'm a woman who uses her body as her work tool. Nothing else is left. Over its history, the ILO has turned its attention to domestic workers repeatedly, frankly, since its pound founding in 1936, 1945, 1948, 1965. Some of the moments when the, the ILO adopted resolutions even called it urgent to enact standards that would be compatible with the self-respect and human dignity which are essential to social justice for domestic workers. 
But consider that there are at least, coming back to, my, to, uh, to migrant work, there is, there's at least 67 million domestic workers in the world, mostly women. And consider that there are one million seafarers, but as you heard, uh, the ILO has adopted uh, close to 70 instruments and recently innovated for that category of worker. So a standard on domestic workers, the abuse that they faced in an era of mass migration, uh, seemed more than overdue. But few underestimated the challenge that this would entail. Uh, standard setting for decent work for domestic workers, quite frankly, quite literally, put the ILO to the test. And I want to underscore here that one aspect uh, that, uh, that needs to be centered is that it's domestic workers themselves who put the ILO to the test. And we tend to think of domestic workers as people who work individually in isolated conditions in their homes, but they also organized. Right? And this uh, imagery from another time, uh, the civil rights movement, is a good one because the tendency, of course, is to think about the civil rights movement and see the image on the left and, of course, Dr. King as that movement. But how many of us remember that the Montgomery bo bus boycotts at the height of that movement um, entailed massive numbers of domestic workers who insisted on walking to work and they weren't just following orders, as Premal and Madison, the author of the book featured on the right, compellingly conveys, they acted at great cost and risk and insisted on respect of their civil rights. And their massive participation in that movement has deep links to their understanding of their own condition, uh, isolated in work, that uh, offered few options domestic workers because of the lack of options in many ways. And as Nadison argues compellingly, the struggle for domestic workers' rights brings greater nuance to the meaning of black freedom and labor organizing. Let me underscore another uh, example that was at the center, frankly, of the ILO's law and practice report that I had the honor to draft. Um, and that report emphasized the extent to which domestic workers have tended to reject, live, in work whenever they have the option and to live out. Um, and that was, has been crucial to carving out some limited autonomy in their work relationships. So a decade ago, domestic workers uh, formed a transnational network. It's now a transnational union federation. It's just had another gathering in Cape Town of domestic workers from around the world. And that network militated for an international standard at the ILO that would force structural change to what I refer to as the asymmetrical law of the household workplace. And by that I mean a global history or legacy of subordination and servitude that operates in particular places, the household as a workplace, and in particular ways on particular women's bodies. It's pluralist law, it's to be understood in socio-legal terms, and it's transnational. It's strikingly common across jurisdictions, uh, and it's unequal. It's largely invisible, in part because it's come to be normalized. We don't see nothing about the relationship was made to allow us to see just how unequal it is. So standard setting had to be part of building a global consciousness about the dignity of domestic work and the dignity of the workers in that occupation. It needed to unsettle the asymmetrical law of the household workplace and normalize the standards that needed to then be observed worldwide. Domestic workers regularly transgress, of course, the house, the market, the nation, uh, but my claim is more than that. They embody a long historical tradition of resistance that refuses to confuse laws that exact servitude with uh, social justice. So that's part of the everyday transgression, and that is what became the transnational challenge to domestic workers, and that's what was brought, to domestic work rather, and that's what domestic workers brought to the ILO. So the standard setting was a key part of how to work against that invisibility and against that unequal law. 
So this side is an image of the committee room where the ILO negotiated the standard setting on decent work uh, in 2010 and 2011. And in the book, I tell the backstory of how domestic workers brought this moment to bear, uh, both to the ILO agenda, but also to the deliberative process that took place over that two-year period and enable the unsettling to occur. And I'd like to highlight two examples today, but first let me just say a little bit about the process. So you know the ILO's tripartite, governments, employers, workers. You know that it's atypical in international organizations, and yet it's supposed to reflect the representation. But it was impossible not to see that in each of the three delegations, there were employers of domestic workers but very few domestic workers at all. And so the representational challenges associated with tripartism were part of that uh, dynamic. And it was necessary to make space for domestic workers to be seen and heard within the process. And when they did have moments, often at the very beginning of each session, they forced constituents to understand the urgency of some of the claims, as well as their claim for norms that weren't just a charter of rights, weren't just hortatory statements about the rights, but actual concrete um, examples of how uh, they could be included. So the standard setting started from a premise that domestic workers were already covered in the vast array of international labor standards in place, including those that the ILO considered to be fundamental the freedom of association, inequality, the prohibition of forced labor and child labor, and the ILO's supervisory bodies had also interpreted international labor standards to make sure that domestic workers' rights were not overlooked. So they called for equal play for work of equal values in committee of experts' uh, reports uh, to valorize the skill involved in domestic work. They challenged the worst forms of child labor. They condemned forced labor conditions in migrant domestic workers' cases. They advocated for labor inspection to be available to domestic workers. And the Law and Practice Report also documented a familiar international treaty making practice. While ILO members often spent a lot of time trying to negotiate flexibility devices, uh, there was a paradox because they were rarely used. And so what came clear in this standard setting process was that member states and employers and workers organizations needed uh, guidance on how to make uh, labor standards uh, relevant uh, to this sector, how to make them implementable in this context. And there was a lot of learning. And the learning happened in a way that was also a traditional. It uh, came largely from states in the global south. Right? So the, who had, ha because of the large numbers of domestic workers, had to um, innovate uh, to put in place some level of transformation. Post-apartheid South Africa is, of course, a, very, a notable example. So it's fair to state that the ILO members came to the task of negotiating the standards with some considerable conviction, but also awareness of the challenge. And the biggest challenge was to ensure that domestic workers had the right to be included, uh, and that uh, that inclusion would not just cover fundamentals, but would also fundamental uh, principles and rights at work, but would also cover the broad gamut of social protection and occupational safety and health and uh, labor inspection uh, and dispute resolution. So uh, now uh, the examples of the unsettling. One uh, concerned labor inspection. And the report highlighted the innovative practices around the world that allow labor inspectors in individual households uh, to, uh, to enter or to respond. And Uruguay figured prominently because of its permission to, of labor inspection, where there was a presumed violation of labor and social security laws, and because it had a form of uh, a special section within its labor administration to put in place these uh, verifications, um, and it also had clear protections. So again, uh, limiting nighttime inspections, for example, requiring judicial authorization. The question was, of course, heavily debated on the floor of the tripartite constituency. 
And the government representative uh, from Hungary on behalf of the European Union sought to amend the initial provision and introduce the notion of respect for privacy as something that should be in the convention itself. And so the government representative from South Africa speaking on behalf of the Africa group rejected the amendment explaining that it didn't examine the whole context of the issue of privacy. One could not deny that households had a right to privacy, but one could not deny that uh, governments also have a right to enforce labor legislation. And so the emphasis was on identifying a necessary balance. Uh, the vice chair of the employers group then cited Article 12 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, and that led to a response by the workers group uh, vice chair who, by the way, has since become the president of Singapore. Uh, and she responded that labor inspection did not amount to arbitrary intrusion into private homes, uh, so that the uh, UDHR was not applicable, and she followed up with arguments. And so you can see from the kind of framing that there was a very much certainly a substantive debate, but also a shifting in terms of what the appropriate normative frame should be. And what was striking as well, less in the record, but that the discussions then led over time increasingly as the comfort level between the different groups um, increased to informal discussions, right? Uh, certainly negotiations, but frank uh, recognitions of the importance of coming to a place where they could agree. Uh, this was particularly pronounced in the second year when one could feel frankly, in the air, uh, that the constituents had a sense that they were in the process of making history. Uh, and uh, they uh, ultimately came up with a sub-amendment, uh, the current uh, text of uh, the convention that preserves the use of labor inspection uh, for domestic work. And by the end of the deliberations uh, in June 2011, no one even seemed to bat an eye when pre-placement inspection visits of households uh, where domestic workers live and work uh, came to uh, discussion. Uh, and so these moments, you might call them aha moments, uh, kind of came through at various points in the committee's deliberations over the two years. Um, sometimes they came more quickly than others. Uh, one of the most surprising to me was around minimum wages, which had been highly contentious for a very long time. And yet, uh, in this context, it was actually the employer's uh, vice chair who expounded on how essential minimum wage was uh, for a category of workers that had been historically marginalized and whose uh, skill levels would otherwise not be seen, uh, an issue that remains crucial um, in practice for domestic workers. And so uh, uh, the discussion as well around payment and time took this approach. Uh, so, uh, it, regarding Canada, uh, the 2010 session uh, is also interesting. There was some discussion about a provision that was put in place uh, to address the issue of uh, the residence uh, of domestic workers, whether they could choose, basically, uh, to uh, live in with their employer or live out. And when Canada sought in 2010 to add an amendment that would say unless residence in the home is a condition of employment, uh, there was uh, quite a response. Uh, so the employers initially seemed to support it. The workers very quickly opposed it as it would take away the freedom of the parties to negotiate. Um, and uh, a lengthy discussion ensued, uh, and then the reframing of Kurd. And the unmistakable subtext, of course, was the extent to which migration schemes are built around the requirement to live in, uh, and uh, the occupational categories um, uh, 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 for domestic workers uh, 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 are framed around that requirement. The labor market availability is framed around that requirement, but that requirement has also been documented, at, documented as a site of uh, untold abuse. So the conference committee engaged with this. The provisions of the draft convention uh, ultimately stood as is. And uh, in Canada, 
uh, the live-in requirement uh, has ultimately been uh, removed, even though uh, Canada has not ratified uh, Convention 189 yet. So in the book, I offer a detailed account of some of the other exchanges. Uh, I uh, will uh, not uh, go into those now, uh, but I do want to emphasize uh, that uh, there are, of course, deeply contradictory impulses um, in the uh, adoption of this uh, convention and in the way in which uh, it plays uh, out. Uh, the convention at once uh, gives an example of how uh, transnational mobilization uh, enabled uh, standard setting to occur. It also provides an opportunity to see the way that transnational mobilization has uh, led to a very significant shift in the way that uh, domestic workers' uh, work and rights are viewed uh, internationally, uh, whether or not the instrument is adopted. And uh, it allows us to sharpen uh, the focus on how we understand uh, the building of transnational legal orders. Uh, so I uh, uh, will not go into the detail about what uh, South Africa's uh, 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 framework looked like. I will uh, mention uh, simply uh, that the uh, transnational legal order when it was adopted, uh, led to quite a considerable um, degree of mobilizing. And you'll see here in this slide uh, that the domestic workers uh, themselves uh, immediately called on states to ratify. Uh, they launched a campaign, 12 ratifications for 12. They have far surpassed that. Uh, now, there are 27 ratifications, which may not seem like much, uh, but the pace of ratification for the ILO is actually quite strong. And this is not an example of landlocked states uh, adopting maritime labor conventions. This is uh, sending and receiving countries, if you um, will, um, ensuring that they uh, become part of what may be referred to as a community of learning around decent work for domestic workers. So allowing examples of experiences from other states. The South Africa context is an excellent example, frankly, of learning around its rapid dispute resolution mechanisms that are available free of charge to domestic workers and that are popularly known and uh, considerably used. Uh, so those mechanisms uh, uh, are learned about, are shared, can be learned about, can be shared. Uh, the uh, ratification, the standard setting, may also be characterized as an instantiation of international solidarity. And the instrument itself, uh, frankly, both the convention and the recommendation, speak to cooperation between states um, uh, on uh, this learning and also on supporting uh, better conditions for domestic workers. So throughout the book, I'm sanguine about the limits and uh, explore some of the contradictory impulses, particularly around labor migration uh, and uh, uh, where the convention stops and where uh, practices continue. Uh, but I want to end today simply by emphasizing the extent to which uh, this standard setting, beyond establishing a basis for cooperation, a basis for law reform, a basis for recognition, uh, also uh, provides uh, a framework uh, for uh, additional um, action. Right, for additional engagement with histories of subordination and servitude uh, and engagement with how 
uh, transnational labour law is to be thought about uh, for people who move uh, under what conditions and for people uh, who are seeking to identify what decent work uh, must involve. Um, so I end uh, the book uh, 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 on two levels. One, uh, for a call to think about uh, the kind of standard setting that surrounded decent work for domestic workers as uh, an opportunity to rethink uh, the foundations of labour law for other categories of workers when we think about the kinds of limits on domestic workers, uh, uh, the ability to call on domestic workers' times, limits to the boundarylessness of their work in this instrument, uh, we have the opportunity uh, to think about what this looks like for workers who enter the labour market with, say, zero-hour contracts and the expectation of perpetual availability. Uh, so that's uh, one example. And the other is a call for the ILO itself, uh, which is uh, sometimes beleaguered, sometimes sidelined, um, uh, invariably uh, reconciliatory amongst uh, different actors uh, that comprise it. This standard setting offered it an opportunity uh, to dig really deeply into what its core uh, principles were about and to do something um, more substantive than I think uh, many thought possible at the time. Um, and in this uh, centenary moment, uh, there's a real opportunity uh, to think about seizing that kind of momentum. So thank you very much for your attention uh, to this. And now I get to put on another hat uh, and uh, uh, thank uh, Anna Torriente uh, who is uh, Senior Legal Officer in the International Labor Standards Department, to thank her for joining us uh, from Geneva, where it is late, uh, and for staying through uh, and for offering to comment on the presentations today. So let me present Anna Torriente to you. Anna Torriente joined the ILO in 1998 after practicing employment discrimination and civil rights law in the United States for 12 years. Uh, she uh, has litigated at both the state and the federal levels there. She's currently the head of the Employment Policy and Tripartite Governance Unit in the International Labor Standards Department. She covers the ILO instruments related to employment, such as those on the development of employment policy, public employment services, and private employment agencies, as well as termination of employment. And in addition, she covers the tripartite consultation uh, convention, uh, number 144, and instruments focusing on special categories of workers, including workers in specific economic sectors, workers with disabilities, and domestic workers. Uh, Ms. Torriente has co-authored a number of ILO training manuals. She's delivered training on international labor standards for judges and labor inspectors, over 600, and with a focus on workplace rights of young women and men and groups in vulnerable situations, including domestic workers. And her recent publications include a guide for employers on providing reasonable accommodation in the workplace for persons with disabilities, on which she collaborated with the ILO's gender branch, and a guide to international labor standards for young people in collaboration with the ILO Employment Policy Department. So we're uh, really grateful to you uh, for being here with us uh, today and look forward to your comments. Thank you. So I guess now I can turn my microphone on. Excellent. <laughs>
coordinate those conventions. I will say, though, that it is, uh, as Professor Millman pointed out, this is a very controversial topic. It has been over the years. Um, Convention 29 is one of the fundamental uh, human rights conventions, and it was one of the earlier instruments that the ILO adopted. But this issue of public-private uh, use of prison labor uh, has been tense for years. And um, as a member of the Secretariat, it's not my role to comment on whether a standard should be approached in a different way or expanded, or whether the public-private divide should be uh, eliminated. But uh, this is really the interpretation of standards is the role of the Committee of Experts that I assume you've talked about what the Committee of Experts is, what the supervisory system of the ILO is. What I can't say, and this is just a comment because Professor Millman did mention that, you know, the hope that the ILO will not basically erode the, posi the position it's taken with regard to the private use of prison labor. And I can just point to a couple of the more recent comments 
migrants or members of disadvantaged communities. So for example, in Latin America, where many countries have ratified the convention, indigenous and tribal peoples are, or um, in African, um, Africans that have come to, for example, to Brazil or to, um, so Afro-Brazilians or Afro-Colombians may be subjected to discrimination. Certainly women are subjected to discrimination at times and exploitation. So this was, this like, element of vulnerability and the vulnerability to discrimination in respect of conditions of work and other abuses of human rights, this was something that was at the forefront. The delegates that were discussing the adoption of the convention really wanted to highlight this. And the other thing they wanted to highlight in the very beginning of this convention, before turning to specific definitions and specific uh, topics that were covered, they clarified what Professor Black had also said, but I think it's worth noting again, that domestic workers are workers, and they are covered under all international labor standards. The convention mentioned certain ones that are considered to be particularly relevant, like the migrant workers conventions, but it made clear that even though countries, many countries, have excluded traditionally domestic workers from national labor law regulations because they're not considered to be workers traditionally, um, they, they are workers and that international labor standards, particularly the fundamental standards, apply to them at, due to all workers. Oh, I've got five minutes. I better hurry up. So, um, as Mr. Black said, the uh, convention has been ratified by 27 countries, but the pace is picking up. Uh, we have at least five more countries that have expressed interest in ratifying, including Sweden, who, which is, uh, is on its way to ratification, uh, Togo, Cote d'Ivoire, and others. Um, so, domestic work, one of the things we've seen, because what my team has been doing since was adopted is looking at the first reports that countries provide on what they're doing to apply the convention, how they're uh, changing or if they're changing their legal framework. And um, so we've been looking at these first reports and seeing what countries are doing. We know that since the adoption of Convention 189, over 70 ILO member states have taken some action regardless of whether they've ratified. And so many have undertaken legal uh, and policy reforms and have developed innovative practices. There are still many, many challenges that remain, uh, but now we're having, we're seeing in the first reports that more and more countries are taking measures to, uh, to define domestic workers as workers, extend labor law protections to them. But there are still many challenges, and I'm just, given the short amount of time, I just want to highlight a few of the things that we've seen about the application in practice. So certainly, domestic work was not considered to be work because it was considered to be work that was taken, um, undertaken for the house, for the family, the household, given traditional gender segregated roles. Um, this was considered to be women's work, and so domestic work was long perceived as an extension of women's tasks and was often undervalued and unprotected. One of the things that we see, for example, is uh, in the context of the minimum wage. For example, there are a number of Central American countries like Costa Rica, Nicaragua, um, Panama, uh, and others that have, um, adopt, have ratified the convention. And for example, Costa Rica have, contains a constitutional protection, as many countries do, that says that there should be a minimum wage to protect decent, you know, basic standards of living for workers. And yet, um, what we found was that in many of these countries, including Costa Rica, domestic workers don't are received wage that is below the minimum wage. Because there's a common perception that domestic workers, mainly with women, working women entering the labor force, wouldn't be able to uh, to cover the salary of a domestic worker. So there's still this perception of domestic workers as really not being workers that are entitled to the same working conditions. And of course, we have to remember that the full title of this convention, 
is the decent work for domestic workers convention. So it's just a, a distinction um, that we that we really need to keep in mind. One of the other things that we've noticed also is this issue about excessive working hours and um, fact that often and this reason the convention calls for standby working hours to be considered as working hours. But what we've seen, for example, in the first report from Germany, and we looked into the practice, uh, is that there will be there's no coverage for domestic workers, no particular protection that are asked to serve basically as nurses and care for disabled or elderly relatives. And they do this through the night and are not contrary to the recommendation. Given their own living space, to which they're entitled to have a space that is private, uh, that is well ventilated and healthy, and that can be uh, closed with a key to, to protect the, the, the worker's privacy. So what we see is that these workers are simply not given their own room. They have to stay in the, in the person, the family member's room, perhaps sleeping in a chair. So these are still, there are many issues that remain uh, with regard to the yes, with regard to um, freedom of association, we've seen that the the presence of unions, both organizations of domestic workers and organizations of of employers of domestic workers, have become much more active. There is an impetus now. Argentina, in its first report, very very proudly uh, referred to the fact that. For the very first time in 2015, uh, they negotiated a collective agreement with the participation of organizations of domestic workers and their employers uh, that raised uh, minimum wage for domestic workers. And we're seeing more and more examples of this. Now, I don't know if you have talked about the process of reporting to the ILO on the application, but one of the impacts that we see is that with the increased presence of organizations of domestic workers, um, under the constitution of the ILO, these organizations, organizations of employers and workers, have the right
Thanks very much. Uh, so let's uh, open up to questions. We have uh, about 15 minutes. Uh, yes, Gigi. Yeah, so my question is for the speaker who talked about the prisoners. Uh, first, congratulations for your paper. Um, it seems that the, 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 the impetus for abandoning the public and private distinction in the context of, of, of prisoners, workers, is basically to be realist in the sense that, well, uh, states have privatized uh, to some extent uh, their services to prisoners and, and the availability of work to prisoners. They, they, they now subsidize private corporations so that, in fact, it, it's really bad for prisoners to, to, uh, to have no sa safeguards against states. Uh, and so for the sake of realism, we should abandon the private uh, public distinction. My question is, you, you mentioned neoliberalism several times in your paper, and you basically say that given the awesome power of ne neoliberalism, given the extended economic reality, we should abandon the public-private distinction because it's no longer le relevant. What if I was to argue as a counterpart that precisely neoliberalism, the whole problem, uh, our tragedy, is precisely the erosion of the public sphere in favor of the public, of the private sphere. And so instead of being rigorously uh, realistic, we should be right, radically ideological in maintaining the distinction between public and private. Because after all, the ILO doesn't simply give recommendations to states, it publishes things that can be uh, taken up by radical activists. Like, for instance, we can people who are uh, uh, throwing a strike uh, to get uh, inter paid internships, and, and I could give other examples. So maybe uh, the public-private distinction is a great ideological weapon uh, that could be used by activists against neoliberalism. Isn't it time that we stop being real realist, realist and that the ILO starts to consider a radically socialist position? Are there other questions that gather with you? Very, very good question. So we share that idea. Uh, it's a philosophical standpoint to, 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 to be that rigorous in that, uh, in that distinction. But anyway, yeah. uh, Professor uh, Milman Sivan presented two courses of action that could help to transcend that public private uh, uh, divide. And I must say the continuum of publicness idea with adapted degrees of normative standards is it's a very innovative idea, very, very ingenious. And I wonder if freedom of, of association could be another course of action. Of course, the prison context necessarily requires an adaptation of freedom of, of association, but the concept itself does transcend the public and private dichotomy. So I was wondering what do you think about it? Can the enforcement of freedom of association with the necessary adaptations represent a response to push forward direct pre prevention of exploitation in prison labor, as it did for other categories uh, of uh, precarious workers like domestic workers, among others. Um, I was struck by Professor Milman Saban's idea of consent and the way that you presented it as being it had to be, I believe, formal, without fear of penalty, and also stimulating free market conditions. And I was wondering how we could think about that mapping also onto domestic workers um, and what that looks like. Particularly, you mentioned that the third element is seen as the most objective, as the most standard. And I was wondering, in our transnational reality, especially in the context of migrant domestic workers, what that element of free market consent looks like, and whether there's any elements built into the convention for domestic workers to shape or protect the features that might pressure or affect workers choosing to undertake that kind of work. Um, my question is about the uh, discussions on the Domestic Workers Convention to any of the three speakers who uh, knows about this, uh, this process. And it's about uh, unions. So unions were briefly mentioned as an element uh, in the regulation of domestic work. 
And I wonder in the discussions on the convention was how important that element was. Uh, in other words, is it the case that we talked less about unions in this context than we do for normal market work? The, that is, even in a context where people acknowledge that it is work and that it needs to be regulated, there would still be a residue of uh, exceptionalism in not giving unions, for instance, the same importance that we do in other spheres of work. So, so if, is that the case? I wouldn't be surprised that that would be the case, that there would be this residue. Um, so I want to ask about that. Yeah, thank you. Great. Okay, here's the very good question. Um, considering domestic workers, given the particularly um, difficult situation that migrant women workers face in the domestic work sector, uh, I was wondering how we can, um, what types of solutions we can uh, propose in order to allow them to seek justice in, in, in when they face themselves in a difficult situation uh, working-wise. Okay, that's a very healthy set of questions. Um, Would you like to start? Sure. Uh, thank you uh, for these questions. Uh, uh, let me begin with the, the idea that we should be more radical and uh, socially uh, ideologist. Um, I am all in. All in. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, so hopefully uh, the crux of my paper is about not giving in to neoliberalism, but then you have to acknowledge, you have to see it. Right? What basically we're saying that we're not seeing all of it. And the concern is that once we, for example, in Israel, once we got rid of private prisons, right? We were all, yoo-hoo, mm -hmm. <laughs> we're done. <laughs> and then we did not see what was going on. And what was going on was that increasingly uh, the conditions of work of prisoners eroded because they were doing most, uh, more uh, peace work, mm -hmm. going around any requirements of minimum wage, because there is no way of even understanding what, mm. right? Like with peace work, there is no way of, <laughs> of even comprehending how much you're getting, right? And there were several legal cases about that. The court was saying, give me some evidence that the other prisoners are also not giving, not getting minimum wage. Maybe it's just you. And then this guy was released from prison, and that was that. So this is just one example of what's going on. The other thing that is going on is that the, the agencies that are doing prison labor are being um, they are now independent units that must be budgeted according to the revenues that they receive. So it's all market now, inside the state. So what I'm saying basically is that in order to radically fight neoliberalism, first of all, we have to see it, right? And we have to see how it is market consideration and profit consideration are eroding work condition within state institutions, right? There are no private prisons at all. Still, the employment unit is being um, uh, constrained by market uh, consideration to the extent that at the moment, there is a cap, <laughs> this is a new thing that we just found out. Mm. There's a cap on 
how much prisoners can make, right? Not minimum, wow. but maximum. Yeah. This is a new thing. Wow. So um, yeah. we're, uh, we started from that. And then we were thinking, nobody is looking at it. Why is nobody looking at wages? Now, why is nobody looking uh, hours of prison labor? Why is it not an issue? And we realize it's because prisoners are not considered to be workers. They were excluded from being defined as employees. And there's actually no reason for that whatsoever according to Israeli law. It, it's just wrong, especially if you take into account work release workers that are working outside of prison. They're still not considered to be employees. So my, uh, to sum up, <laughs> um, I think that we, the danger is that the, the, the ILO can hold the fort so, you know, so, so far. Like there's, mm. there's, mm. it's going to erode because mm. the UK, Germany, Australia, Austria, these are just recent examples, right, of observation. The, the states are pushing back and the states are basically telling the ILO, if you read their replies, they're telling, Tell, they're saying to the ILO, the, uh, your interpretation of the standard is just illegitimate and we're not going to do it. Uh, uh, this is, <laughs> this is uh, uh, disturbing. Yeah. So um, yeah. uh, hopefully there's going to be progress uh, with that. Now, uh, freedom of association, definitely. I am all for freedom of association. There is a big problem with freedom of association. Uh, even, we, even before we start thinking about freedom of association for prisoners, if a country does not have freedom of association for the prison guards, mm -hmm. right? And this is especially true for all privatized prisons where they're not <laughs> they don't have freedom of association. And keep in mind, many, many countries do not have, I'm not sure about Canada, yeah. uh, but do not have freedom of association rights or full freedom of association rights for police officers, right? So the leap to, to give you really, my, you know, my, my intuition, is that you really need to work through that before you go to freedom association of prisoners, especially where much of the the uh, um, the, the the problem is that uh, work is being regarded as means of control. Right. This is like the main thing that. <laughs> Even if it's not explicitly said, yeah. basically they say, you know, th what what they're doing is they're giving work, so prisoners are not going to have riots, etc. So freedom of association is, I think, even more radical than the the, the radical ideas that I have proposed. Uh, so uh, <laughs> I know. Yeah. Fabulous. Um, um, Anna Toriento, would you have um, some comments first and then I'll respond? Okay, just briefly, thank you, Professor Blackett. Yeah, uh, with regard to what are um, steps that could be taken to protect the rights of uh, female migrant domestic workers, although I would have to say male, male migrant domestic workers also face certain risks, but overwhelmingly, uh, particularly in countries like uh, Latin American countries, over 90% of the domestic workforce is female. Um, some of the measures that can be taken are um, obviously information campaigns to make sure sort of legal literacy campaigns that are conducted in languages that are accessible uh, to the migrant workers, um, particularly along certain migration corridors, for example, from Paraguay uh, to Argentina is one. And so um, 
in those in those cases uh, that should be made accessible in a format that's easy to understand. There should be special training for inspectors, for labor inspectors, so that they um, are sensitized to the, the concerns uh, and this particular characteristics of domestic work. There should also be capacity building for the social partners. So capacity building uh, to, to build the capacity of uh, trade unions, particularly organizations of domestic workers and of domestic workers' employers to uh, lobby, to reach understandings and improve the working conditions of domestic workers. Model contracts is one. Also hotlines. Some countries have established hotlines for domestic workers that are confidential where they can um, flag uh, abusive conditions if they're being uh, uh, locked up, if they're being uh, physically or verbally abused. Um, also, uh, there could be uh, registration requirements so that migrant domestic workers, the convention provides that they should get copies of their contract before they leave the country to go to the destination country, but also under a number of agreements, uh, there's a requirement that the contract then be registered uh, with the authorities in the host country, and that is a, an added protection for the migrant domestic worker. One issue that isn't often mentioned is the issue of termination, because what we see in a number of the Arab countries is that uh, there may there's no provision for, let's say that the domestic worker is fired for any reason or no reason, uh, they may be forced to leave the home almost immediately. And if they feel that their termination is wrongful under the kafala system that exists there, it's the employer that has sponsored the, a migrant domestic worker to come, and the, the worker can't just go find another employer. Often they have to leave the country, which is a practical matter, impedes their being able to file a wrongful termination claim, and uh, they may not have anywhere else to stay. If they're kicked out of the home, that they're working with no notice. So it's something that I find uh, certainly a conundrum and one that isn't really focused on very much. So um, those are some of the things. And also, of course, the, the need to protect uh, uh, workers from having their identity documents seized, their freedom of movement needs to be ensured, also they, so they can meet other domestic workers from joint associations. And, um, and there should be provisions in the, the, the national law to ensure that domestic workers are not charged fees. There's a uh, publication from the UN High Commissioner of Human Rights um, called Behind Closed Doors that talks about undocumented female migrant domestic workers and the abuses they face. And often they may get to a country and then the employer deducts uh, basically a fee they might have paid to a government agency and somehow then they transfer that cost to the migrant worker who is basically uh, in a very vulnerable position to defend against that. So those are uh, basically a list of uh, certain elements that should be taken into consideration. Great, thanks very much. So thanks for the questions. And uh, I'll start maybe with um, where uh, uh, Professor Milman Sivan left off on. Uh, the freedom of association dimensions and um, it uh, raised for me uh, a reflection around uh, the role of domestic courts in acting in part to buttress the kinds of interpretations that we're seeing from the ILO uh, including on uh, the kinds of protections that should surround uh, prison labor uh, and that are getting pushback from states but the dialogue isn't only with the governmental actors and one of the factors that we've been looking at very particularly in the Canadian context is what courts do with uh, that information and so in the Canadian context one of the directions that, uh, that uh, our Supreme Court has taken has been to recognize the freedom of association rights, right, of uh, RCMP, <laughs> right, R mounted police. Um, and where does that lead us, right? And is there then uh, the potential uh, for movement in the kind of direction that the question proposed or other directions, right, that could be helped by 
the dialogue that can take place between supervisory bodies uh, and and the courts, and that uh, uh, arguably is part of uh, the framing of international labor law uh, transnationally. Right? So, so the, so you raise uh, I think that uh, that that dimension uh, uh, certainly warrants some attention. Um, it is uh, also, of course. Um, uh, Controversial, right? And it leads to, to, to reactions uh, on uh, the uh, role of unions. Thank you for that question. In the drafting and negotiation of uh, Convention 189 and Recommendation 201, there was actually additional care placed on how to ensure that we weren't just framing these instruments as protective instruments, poor domestic workers, vulnerable, they need, and you can tell from my own framing, really, frankly, inspired by the extent to which domestic workers, despite their isolation, have acted collectively and shown the desire to form unions. Often, uh, what they faced is constraints by legislation in different jurisdictions. And so the convention, uh, in particular, uh, has sought to specify not only freedom of association, collective bargaining rights for domestic workers, but actually to turn attention to what kinds of regimes uh, might be necessary to ensure that that freedom of association is actually practicable. Uh, and so models that exist, sometimes older models, collective decrees-based models that legislatively extend uh, collective bargaining uh, rights and collective agreements themselves uh, to uh, uh, domestic workers across a particular territory, uh, but that have at their core uh, representative organizations. And in some of the, you know, I couldn't go into everything, but in some of the uh, uh, research that I did in France around this, you could see there were varying degrees of engagement by the unions themselves with uh, the domestic workers associations and the sans papier uh, the dimension of this uh, to uh, ensure participation. But there actually was a heightened attention and one of the most interesting moments in the negotiation was actually when the employers themselves um, almost walked out, uh, and, um, and it was around uh, freedom of association because they actually were arguing that they, their freedom of association rights must be recognized too in the instrument. So, so quite an interesting dynamic that uh, surrounded that, but it was, um, I think, pivotal to uh, making this an instrument that takes decent work seriously as not just protection, but also, also action. The question of consent, I mean, that is uh, that's such a pivotal uh, question, um, uh, I would argue, and the role of the committee of experts uh, will be crucial here. The negotiation of this instrument, certainly the first year, uh, extremely delicate, right? Who knew where this would go and when the, a real concern was that it might um, roll back some of the protections that are accessible to domestic workers and other instruments, right? And so uh, in areas like this where you were actually adding something that wasn't specifically mentioned but where there were examples in other comparable sectors, uh, there was a, a real attempt to try to at least push the envelope a bit. And so the consent framing was a way to push back against an instrument that might actually legitimize schemes that require a domestic worker to live in. So if you want to come back to the public-private distinction, it one was operating around the very public face of the programs by states. Um, but I think there's a tremendous role for the committee of experts as it works through the uh, interpretation of this instrument to then help 
uh, with an understanding that moves beyond, frankly, simplistic understandings of the kinds of power relationship uh, that um, that is uh, is available within uh, the the domestic work uh, context uh, when so much is on the line for people who move. Right, um, and to give an example in the Canadian context, once the uh, the re specific requirement for live-in was removed, and you know nobody was really cheering because very soon it became clear that people were doing labor market assessments based on you know where do we actually need domestic workers? Well, chances are we need them where they are required to live in, and so could very easily what looks like a legal change that could be positive is actually. Um, a chimera of, of change. Um, on migrant workers, I think uh, much attention was turned there. Um, it might not surprise you that my um, uh, inquiry into the migration dimensions uh, is arguably more fundamental, right? And uh, I think that uh, there's a lot that we can do and there's a lot that the instrument does to palliate some of the worst forms of abuse in the migration context, uh, and there's a litany of them, right? And so you have instruments that speak to, dimensions of the instrument that speak to the withholding of passport documents, the charging of fees by agencies, and all of that. Um, but, uh, and I raise this in the book, at some point we have to come to terms with um, the ways in which we um, create construct, sustain precariousness um, in work relationships uh, uh, because of uh, deep inequality that leads to these movements. Um, we are quick to analogize um, the abuses to trafficking and slavery um, and to zero in on uh, bad traffickers, right, the worst agencies, uh, um, I would submit that our problem requires a different and more fundamental inquiry into the, uh, the role of states uh, in the way that we structure uh, migration. Uh, and um, frankly, I think that's a more apt historical comparison, <laughs> frankly, uh, if we're going to use uh, language like slavery. Uh, which was, of course, legal. Uh, and then we have to think about how we, we undo. And this is, of course, not fashionable at all in this moment. Uh, but I do think that uh, at some point we have to ask um, questions uh, about the kinds of structures we're building and then to what extent um, uh, our uh, palliative frameworks um, actually uh, respond. Uh, on that, I will just uh, come back to the issue of intersectionality um, in the instrument. So there's preambular language, uh, but then there's a really quick move towards seeing domestic work in purely gender terms. And uh, part of the work here is an invitation to uh, think again, structurally, uh, to think historically and to understand the domestic work relationship as very much capturing histories of subordination and bringing them forward so it's not just any women's work, it's particular women's work. And I think until we grapple with that, why it's indigenous women, why it's women from uh, you know, uh, the, much of the colonized world, um, uh, we won't, a formally colonized world, we won't actually um, be able to resolve the issues that, that surround domestic work. So there's a lot that's been done, and there's a lot of unsettling that remains to be done um, yeah, in this field. So uh, thank you all uh, for the, the fabulous questions and the fabulous engagement. And now I'm pleased to invite Emily Ann Painter uh, to thank our guest. So on behalf of uh, the Labor Law and Development Research Lab, the Trudeau Foundation, as well as the McGill University Faculty of Law, I'd like to extend a very, very warm thank you to our speakers, commentators, um, uh, 
for really a fascinating discussion today, uh, presentations that are so timely and very important and that really illustrate the difficulties of standard setting in perhaps non-traditional workspaces. So thank you so, so, so much. And um, as a small token of our appreciation, and thank you. <laughs>